Um, it's my real pleasure to welcome you here to uh, the second of our public lecture series for 2013. Uh, at Alzheimer's here, we, in the past, we've had guest speakers uh, that are brought to Australia, mainly from the National Office in Canberra of Alzheimer's Australia. And uh, we've, we've had, really, it's been an ad hoc arrangement and uh, we looked at it this year and we thought with a little bit of extra work we could create a whole calendar of events um, and it's really uh, the driver for that was that we really want to increase the conversation uh, and, the, and the quality of information out in the community uh, about dementia and uh, with, um, with a little extra effort and calling on local experts who can stand their ground uh, against any international competition, we've been able to create the full year calendar of lectures that uh, you've obviously seen. Uh, we've got 170 people booked in to attend tonight and uh, so it just goes to prove that uh, we've got as much class in our own town, uh, Leon, as uh, what we might see from overseas. But we're really excited. Uh, we've, we've decided we'd, we'd try and hold the lecture series all in the same place, uh, have the same branding around them so that the community would get used to uh, hearing about them and increasing the interest about having a conversation uh, about dementia amongst us. So um, welcome to you all. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Leon Flicker here tonight uh, to be our guest speaker. Uh, Leon will be known to many of you. Uh, he was appointed the inaugural chair or, and professor of geriatric medicine here at UWA in 2006. Seems such a long time ago. 19, uh, no, sorry, 1998. That's even longer. And in two, it was 2006 that uh, Leon sometimes still looks like he should be a boy in short pants still. But anyway, <laughs> apparently in 1998 he was qualified. Um, but, uh, and then in 2006 um, appointed director of the Western Australian Centre for Health and Ageing. Um, he has been, um, had, had peer-reviewed articles uh, published almost too many times to count, but I got to 250 and stopped counting Leon. And uh, in having a look at some of those things, um, some of the things that I thought in particular were of interest um, was that um, some of his research highlight have included, for example, demonstrating that vitamin D supplementation reduced fall rates by 30% in residential care facilities. Um, in a sunshine state like Western Australia, we know that a, a large number of our older people and our children uh, have vitamin D deficiencies, but it is even more acute in residential care. And that smoking is a risk factor for dementia, and that older smokers exhibit structural brain changes very similar to those people with early Alzheimer's disease. When I, I've only been in this really fabulous job for about seven months and I count it a real privilege and a challenge and uh, I've said to the staff you need to get out of bed and get your skates on every day because uh, it's busy and it's fast paced and the shelf life of information um, in uh, this area is about 18 months I think uh, and then we, it gets taken over with us uh, we learn something more. Uh, we actually know very little about the function of the brain and I, I think that we've just got most of the learning about the brain and its function and dementia. We've got most of our learning ahead of us. But when I've had the opportunity to meet with um, families and uh, individuals or couples who uh, access the services of <coughs> Alzheimer's here in WA, um, they have a couple of consistent messages. And I won't go into the others, but one of those, probably three messages that I hear consistently is the frustration that they have had about a diagnosis. And that frustration often stays with people for years. 
Uh, international data shows that um, a diagnosis of, de of dementia uh, takes an average of 3.1 years. If it's younger onset dementia, it's more than five years before a diagnosis is achieved. Um, with younger onset dementia, it's, it's highly likely that there will be um, a misdiagnosis or no diagnosis for quite some time. So diagnosis is a very, very um, uh, a, a very um, topical in, uh, issue for people who access our services, Leon, and I think that um, that's indicated in the large numbers of people who've come to hear from you tonight. So um, it's and another reason why we asked you uh, to talk on this subject. So I thank you so much all for making the effort to come out here uh, tonight. It's really important that we have the best of information and that we keep the conversation about dementia going, that we help to take away the stigma and the mystery, and that we learn more so that we can improve the way uh, we respond to people who are living with memory loss in Western Australia. So would you join with me in welcoming Liam, Professor Liam Flicker to the podium. Well, I... Thank you, Rhonda, for that over-generous introduction. Um, I was worried for a while there when she started talking about the classy presenters and wondering what I was doing here, because nobody ever refers to me as that. I've been giving this talk on and off for about 25 years, and this is by far the biggest audience I've had. So I'm not sure what that means, and I'm a little worried by it. Can I just, uh, about how many of people here, if, can you put your hand up if you are a health professional? Uh huh. And how many of people here would be a carer or be concerned about somebody with dementia or themselves? Yep. That's what I thought. Anyway, so if I start pitching this wrongly, can you let me know and interrupt me as I go along? Uh, <clears throat> I will, long experience has taught me that about now I start losing people, you know. <laughs> I start hearing the occasional snore about this time. And so that has meant that I actually put in the summary of the whole talk on this slide. <laughs> so if you can just read to the end of the slide and then go to sleep, please then you'll be all right, okay? So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. And then you, if you memorise it, you can then convince your friends and colleagues that you actually did attend. I'm going to be explaining to you why dementia is important and why the numbers are increasing. I'll explain to you what I think dementia is. I'll explain how we diagnose and assess people with dementia. And I'll be talking about some of the new imaging and biomarkers, but they're not that helpful clinically at this stage, okay? I'll be talking about pharmacological management. I'll be talking about other treatment strategies. And I'll basically, the last slide will tell you why I think this isn't a tsunami. This is a problem that Australia can deal with rationally, rationally and systematically. But not necessarily everybody believes me. Now, this is why dementia has appeared, and it's a good reason. We keep forgetting this, but one of the ra major reasons that we have so many people with dementia in Australia now is that we're all living longer, right? So the reason why we have so much dementia is uh, coming from a good thing. There's nobody who wants to live shorter. We live longer, and that puts us at risk from the neurodegenerative diseases of old age. And we originally thought that this was largely due to public health measures. This is not so. We keep living longer since the 1960s. And we live about one to two years longer every decade since the 60s. Or, as one of my colleagues has put it, you get an extra weekend for every week you live. <laughs> Australians can understand that. <laughs> so in 
So this is what's happening. Australia is no longer exhibiting a population pyramid. That's, these are five-year age groups with the number of people uh, proportionate to the size of the bars. And you can see that in 2004, which was the pale bars, that it looked like a pyramid. In 2051, it's doing what I do, which is this middle-aged spread. Do you see that? That's because we've got a lot more people in the 40s and 50s than in the early 20s and, te and teens. By 2100, the population will be skewed to the over 85 year olds. And that's the group most at risk for dementia. This is why dementia is occurring, because there are so many more older people around. Now, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's lots of very good documents around. There's the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has just produced another very good document about dementia. And there they've calculated there's possibly 300,000 people with dementia in Australia today. We really don't know that. All that data is based on studies that were done largely in the 90s or earlier in the early 90s or the 80s or 70s. But our best estimates are that that's about right if the <coughs> dementia incidence has not changed in the last 20 years. Is this likely to be true? We don't know. We know that people, that strokes, that people who develop a stroke during life, that incidence, for the, once you adjust for age, that has reduced by 25% in Australia in the last 25 years. We know that people who fracture their hips, when you look at the age-adjusted figures, that's decreased by 25%. We really don't know what the true number of people with dementia in Australia is currently, but if we assume that the figures from the, the 80s and 90s is correct, then roughly around 300,000 people are present with dementia in Australia now. We know that the majority are women, but probably the more important figure is that 75% of people with dementia are over 75 years of age. So that's a very important thing to remember. 75% of people with dementia are over 75 years of age in Australia. And that's because the number of people with dementia doubles for every five years past the age of 60. And so how I teach this to medical students is that if you look at the prevalence of dementia between the ages of 60 to 65, it's 1%. Between 65 and 70, it's 2%. 70 to 75, it's 4%. 75 to 80, it's 8%. 80 to 85, it's 16%. And if it's 85 plus, there's roughly a third of the people have dementia. That is very close to the actual prevalence figures. Now you can see immediately that the major risk factor is age and the way to stop getting dementia is to die young. <laughs> we also know that roughly about 30% of the people with dementia in residential care. That is probably an underestimate because that's based on the ACFI instrument. That's a routine data instrument for costings. We have no idea how accurate that figure is. We suspect, I suspect, it's a major underestimate of the number of people with dementia in residential care. I suspect it's probably closer to 40%, at least. So this is what's going to happen with time. This is the tsunami. This is the idea that the age-specific incidence, which is this curve at the top, this straight line at the top, I won't, maybe I can do it this way. So this is this straight line at the top. We're saying that the age-specific incidence doesn't change at all but the prevalence will simply because of the increasing number of older people. This is for women, you can do the same for men. Already dementia is the third commonest cause of death in Australia. 
Now, people who die with dementia don't, don't necessarily die from dementia, but the doctors who are filling those death certificates are saying that dementia has contributed to the death. And this has changed. And it's largely changed because doctors now write it on the death certificates. So it's the third commonest cause of death in Australia. This is a big problem. And when you look at the lives lost either by disability or by death, dementia is now the second commonest cause of years of life lost in Australia. The difference here is that when you look at the commonest cause, which is heart disease, you'll see that the disability burden is relatively small. Dementia, on the other hand, the disability burden is very large. So it doesn't actually kill you directly, but it diminishes the life of people towards the end of life. And that's the big difference. So this is an important condition, no matter how you look at it. Now, just in case you think that this is getting too big for Australia and that we should get too worried and throw up our hands, remember that Australia is a wealthy country with a very well-established medical system and that has more than enough resources to deal with this problem. If you go to the developing world, they have a much greater proportionate increase in people with dementia and they don't have the money. The developing world is largely getting older before they're rich. So if you think this is a tough problem in Australia, go to our immediate neighbours, go to Indonesia, go to China, go to India. That's a tough problem. The problem in Australia is e relatively easily manageable. Don't throw up our hands, just work out our ways of dealing with this. Okay, so what is dementia? Now this is the current definition. I was explaining to Rhonda that the biggest problem that's looming on the horizon is that definition may get changed. And in fact, there's quite a lot of work now that people are doing in other parts of the world which will abolish the definition. So for the last 20 years I've been trying to teach people what dementia is and now I'll have to unteach them which is part of the joys of this sort of job. So this is what dementia is currently, and hopefully this will be for a few more years. And this is the International Classification of Diseases, 10th Revision, World Health Organisation. Firstly, dementia is a, a syndrome, not a specific diagnosis, it's a syndrome, and it's due to the disease of the brain. People don't make it up, they just don't have ageing brains, they have a disease of the brain. This was very important. In the 80s, this actually established the ground that we work on. And we do still believe it's that dementia is a syndrome due to the disease of the brain. It's usually chronic and progressive, and it has to be present at six months for a confident clinical diagnosis. Now, dementia doesn't ha can start very rapidly and can occur very quickly and people can have it from then on. For example, if you've had a new stroke on top of old strokes, people often develop dementia in that time period very quickly. The trouble is that we're not sure whether that person's going to get better because people after strokes get better. So we are more confident as health professionals, if the diagnosis has been present for six months or the condition, the syndrome has been present. Now, the next part of the definition defines that you have to have memory impairment. Now, memory impairment is not the only, memory is not the only thing the brain does. It's an important thing but it's not the only thing the brain does. And people can have impairments in other brain functioning, which will affect people's lives, but without the memory impairment, we don't call it dementia. That's probably the biggest difference from the new definitions that are, are proposed. But they say 
it's not essential to have memory impairment. That other brain's functions that are really severe that affects people's behaviour may be equally important. But at present, dementia has to have memory impairment. But if you have memory impairment by itself, that's not enough to cause dementia. And what's some of the other things that people have that, that um, justify the syndrome of dementia? They have impairment in judgment, in planning, in doing language, in calculation, in running their lives, in perceptual problems. And these commonly occur in people with dementia. So the syndrome is more than just memory at this stage. Now, because it's a tough diagnosis to make during life, we say that an attempt should be made to make sure that nothing else is causing the problem, and particularly depression, because we know that depression, severe depression, can often look a bit like dementia. Right? So this is the idea that if somebody is severely depressed, they are disinterested in the world around them and they don't necessarily respond to the world around them like they do normally. Now, the trouble here is that depression and dementia go together so often. When you look at somebody with early dementia, often those people are depressed. And the other thing that we know that complicates the story is that if you get depression for the first time in later life, so if you get depression for the first time after the age of 65, you are much more likely to get dementia later on. So this complicates the picture, but one of the things that we say right at the beginning is that depression and dementia have to be distinguished if possible. Now, Having looked at the age group of the audience, uh, it's obvious what the next point is. Those of you in the audience are in decline. <laughs> I know that by the presence of the grey hair and the other features indicating that to me. But the real problem is that our brains start declining relatively young. In fact, we probably reach our peak intellectual performance at the age of 20. It's, it's despairingly young, is it not? Now, but fortunately, we have a thing called crystallised intelligence or wisdom that we accumulate. And that's the way we fool young people that were not declining. <laughs> so it's really important that we distinguish the differences in the deterioration in intellectual functioning as we grow older, which are relatively minor from those things that are really important and are affecting people's lives. And that's one of the hallmarks of the condition to date, that the decline in intellectual functioning must be severe enough to affect personal or occupational functioning. This is the next tip. It, as well as dying young, the next way to avoid dementia is to find yourself a job where nobody can tell when you're declining. <laughs> I have such a job. <laughs> Unfortunately, my nurses are all laughing and agreeing with it. The final thing is that, it's that we also know that dementia and delirium coexist very often together. People with dementia, whenever they get sick from any other reason, an infection, an operation or whatever, that they're more likely to get delirium. But we also say that you cannot make the diagnosis of dementia for the first time when somebody's delirious. Because once again, you don't know what they would be like after they finish, right? So 
after the delirium has lifted, we don't know whether they'll return to normal or whether they'll have dementia. So these are the important things about what we call dementia to date. And once you know the definition, you can then see how the assessment and diagnosis is made. The assessment and diagnosis to this time has been largely clinical. Now, the commonest cause of dementia in Australia is Alzheimer's disease. And it's relatively simple. This is a disease where we think there's characteristic pathology in the brain, and the pathology is considered largely to be plaques and tangles. This also, this disease process, affects somebody to have Alzheimer's disease when they have the presence of dementia, and it's characterised by an insidious onset and slow, and slow deterioration. And then we make some other comments would suggest that it's not vascular dementia or, or other causes. This is what vascular dementia is, or vascular dementia is often used to be called multi-infarct dementia or multiple stroke dementia. And it's a condition where mostly the people have an interruption to the, the blood supply of the brain causing multiple lesions, giving the dementia syndrome. And the people here look a bit different. Rather than having an insidious onset and slow progression, they often have quite sudden onset and they have stepwise deterioration. And they often have physical findings which suggest that they've had a stroke. And those are the simple features which distinguish it. Now I'm going to talk a, a, a couple of relatively uncommon dementias, but these are important because they have a different presentation and the mayhem that they cause is often quite extreme. The first one is frontotemporal dementia and Pick's disease is a particular type. The problem here is that these people still have dementia and memory impairment, but the memory impairment does not dominate the picture. The picture that is dominated by the frontal features, the frontal part of the brain, which is very important in modulating behaviour. And these pe people particularly show disinhibited behaviour. And so these people often come to attention not because of memory impairment, but because of the behaviour which gets them into trouble. And a very important characteristic of this problem is that they have anosognosia, which is the inability to recognise your own problem. So this is a very, um, fortun fortunately, this is a relatively uncommon form of dementia, but it affects, tends to affect people a bit younger, in their 40s, 50s and 60s, tends to be, uh, predominantly affect men as opposed to women, and often presents with major problems in their lives, with the police, with crime, which only becomes apparent later that this is the problem. This is, um, now the next form of dementia isn't that uncommon, and this is Lewy body dementia. And this is a condition that we only recognised in the 90s. This condition has been around for as long as we can think of but we never recognised it, okay? We used to call these people Alzheimer's disease, but we used to scratch our heads and wonder what was happening. Now, these people are very similar to people with Alzheimer's disease. People with Lewy body dementia <coughs> look very sim similar to people with Alzheimer's disease, but they're distinguished by three things, and they're very, relatively straightforward. The first one is that they have fluctuating cognition. What does that mean? If you talk to people who look after people with dementia, they'll say that everyone has good days and bad days, right? Everyone, know, everyone notices that. And that's actually extremely complicated pathologically and physiologically, but we don't really understand it. But that's a simple observation. 
that people with dementia on the whole have good days and bad days. People with Lewy body dementia have good minutes and bad minutes. Right? It fluctuates wildly during the day. And the other thing is that these people are particularly prone to the syndrome where in the evening they get much worse. Right? So in the e during the morning, often they can look almost entirely normal, but in the evening they're much worse. The second feature is that they have visual hallucinations. Hallucinations are when you see things that other people can't see. And the things that people with Lewy body dementia complain about is they see small animals or children. Now, I have no idea why, all right? People will say, well, why is that? I don't know. But I talk to patients occasionally, and when I do, they talk to me about this. They see little children or animals in the evening. And they're not particularly worried by it, but this is the syndrome, that, this is what they notice. And families are often very concerned because they, because this is, to them, seems like madness. This is usually associated with Lewy body dementia and rarely needs treatment by itself. Once you've explained that it's part of this syndrome, people are very relaxed about it. And the third feature is that people have Parkinson-like symptoms. That means they have difficulty moving often associated with the tremor of Parkinson's disease and the rigidity. If you have two of those three features and you have a dementia-like syndrome, you've got Lewy body dementia. You don't need to do anything else, that's what you've got. And perhaps up to one in 10 of people with dementia will have this syndrome. It's very common, we don't recognise it, we don't discuss it much, once we actually describe it, people are on the whole relieved because it becomes more obvious. The next thing, is, so we're going to move away for dementia now. We're going to be talking about this thing called mild cognitive impairment. Now, this is a difficult entity. And this is the latest name for a syndrome that people will notice that they have memory problems, but they don't have dementia. And the thing that usually distinguishes this feature is that you can have memory problems and difficulties in performance in your cognitive functioning, that means in memory or other functioning, but you do not have any functional impairment. Now, the problem with this is we have no real idea what the prognosis is. We know that if you have this syndrome and you come to see me in the memory clinic, you are very likely to get dementia over the next five years. If you have this syndrome and don't see me in the memory clinic, then you're unlikely to get dementia. And in fact, 20% of you will get better by yourselves. So that means that if you've got this syndrome, don't see me. Because <laughs> it's bad for you, do you see? The evidence is it's bad for you. Now exactly why this is, we're not certain. Obviously the real reason is, if you come to see me in the memory clinic, you've gone through a lot of hoops and hurdles to get to me. So there's some, so a lot of people have started to think that there's something wrong with you. And that's why you've been filtered into me. But we know that if you look at the community and if you looked at surveys of people who aren't necessarily seeking clinical attention, that 20% of those people will get better. And rather strangely, some of these people will actually seem to grow a bit more brain. Right? That's some of the latest work. And it's very surprising. We are now realising the brain is a much more dynamic organ than we originally thought. So this idea that mild cognitive impairment is this little sort of waiting room going on to dementia and you just wait there for a while for varying periods and then you end up with dementia is not clear cut. Some people get better and avoid the waiting room and go back 
Some people die from something else and some of those people go to get dementia. And depending on how, where you are and how you got into the waiting room will largely determine what your prognosis is. Now the other thing which I thought was clear cut 25 years ago and as I've got older I've got more confused about is Alzheimer's disease and normal ageing. If we all live long enough, would we all develop Alzheimer's disease? And the short answer is, we don't know. As people grow older, the pathology that we associate with Alzheimer's disease becomes more and more common in older people. And more and more of those older people, despite having the pathology, seem to have norm, relatively normal brain functioning. And this is coupled with the other idea that dementia, that syndrome that we've been discussing, is nearly all Alzheimer's disease. Now, there isn't actually all that much evidence about that. The original study that was done in 1968 had 45 people. It's really a very small study for this, the whole story to be based on. This is a more recent study from the, uh, presented in New England Journal of Medicine looking at the, um, the MRC, the Medical Research Council of the UK study, of quite a large study. And what they did was they looked at the brains of people, uh, this is after death, they looked at the brains of people who either had dementia during life or didn't have dementia during life. And what they found was that if you had a lot of brain shrinkage, that remained a very good indication of whether you did or didn't have dementia. That people, through all the ages, if you had more brain shrinkage, you were more likely to have dementia, as demonstrated clinically uh, and when we looked at under the microscope after death. But the pathology of plaques and tangles was different. And the pathology of plaques and tangles is the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see, that at the age of 70, the pathology of plaques distinguished between people with and without dementia very well. But by the age of 90, it didn't. Similarly with the tangles, that the pathology of the tangles did not distinguish between people with and who appeared normal or who had appeared to be dementia. Now you're saying, oh, that's the end of life. We don't have to worry about that. You have to remember that 50% of people with dementia are over the age of 80. This is a big problem. So it means that the atrophy, the brain shrinkage, seems to be a more important issue as people grow older than just the, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. The, the amyloid hypothesis has now been around for approximately 30 years. And it's a very simple hypothesis. And that is that the accumulation of plaques and tangles in the brain has a stable pathogenic appearance and that this eventually leads to dementia. And that once it starts, it keeps going until you get dementia. And that if, if it was stable, you could pick it early and then eventually you would be able to halt the progression in some way by interfering with the disease process and stop dementia occurring. The problem with this hypothesis, and it is still a hypothesis, is that we do not have any treatment based on this that works. And in fact, we have one study which removed the amyloid from the brain and actually people got worse. So this is a problem with this hypothesis. And it may be that you could explain all of these findings by saying that the amyloid pathology occur occurs because it's a manifestation of the brain repairing itself. It would explain everything that we've seen. And that's why people with Alzheimer's disease, whatever it's due to, because the brain is trying to repair itself, the plaques and tangles accumulate.
We don't know. This is the point about where we are at this stage. But this is important because we and everybody around the world would like to diagnose Alzheimer's disease really early with certainty. We would like that, would we not? And talking to families and doing memory tests is time consuming. We get it wrong quite a bit. Not that much, I might add. We get it wrong about 5 to 10%, which isn't bad in medicine. If you had to work out how often we get it wrong, it's not so bad in this area, really. You know, we get it wrong lots of other times, too. But I won't necessarily go into all of them. Um, so, so we get it wrong a bit, but not that much. But it would be easier if we had a simple test. And this is the idea that somehow there's this picture that the pathology accumulates for a long time in the brain, and then we get this syndrome of mild cognitive impairment, and then we develop dementia. And it's hoped there might be mechanisms to pick this process up early, and that when the amyloid is accumulating in the brain before everything else, that we might be able to do something. Now, the only problem with some of this work, this is a cartoon. People have often presented this everywhere. The problem with this is that when we look at the data, as far as we can tell, this curve, which is to do with the atrophy of the brain as measured by very sensitive means of looking at the brain volume, that does better than the amyloid in the brain. So that's a problem, right? We may be replacing fairly sensitive methods of finding out the atrophy, just looking at how much brain shrinkage, with things that don't work as well. That is the reason why we need more research. There have been proposals, and these are largely to do with experimental studies, about looking at people's brains, trying to look at the um, amyloid in the brain, trying to look at the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid around the brain, which we can uh, get relatively easily, not that easily in my hands actually, because I used to be terrible at that procedure. And so therefore I've long since abandoned it and given it to somebody who knows what they're doing. But, but getting the fluid from around the brain and to see at the uh, amyloid protein and the tau protein, to see if we can measure that and work out whether people have uh, Alzheimer's disease or not. The trouble with all that is that we still don't know some really basic answers. The, the, my colleague, Professor Ames from Melbourne, he's leading a very big um, collaboration around Australia, mainly between Melbourne and Perth. Professor Ralph Martins has been involved in that. And they've recently presented their data from the last six, seven years. And it's been important. But what they've said there is that the amyloid protein is occurring 17 years before the development of any symptoms. And that's on average. So the range will be huge. It will be like between 10 and 30 years. So 17 years before symptoms. And that people will develop a pre-dementia phase, mild cognitive impairment by another name, of four years. And it's also clear that when you look at the ages of the people who have been studied, that the, the majority, more like 60 to 70 percent of people, will die before they develop dementia. So this is a problem when we're trying to identify something so early with so little precision. It's going to be a big problem trying to use this clinically at this stage. This is some work I did with the Cochrane uh, group in the U UK. And this has shown, for all intents and purposes, that the available literature on this is tiny. We have something like 50 to 60 patients at the time who have been assessed with PIB scanning. 
there is relatively little information we can base our best estimates on how these, inf how these diagnostic tests work. So I'm cautioning about the use of these things apart from in properly conducted research studies like the ADNI study or the ABLE study. That's where we should be doing them. Not clinically yet. Now this is a very important thing that's been going around Australia at this moment. And those of you been involved in dementia or some of the um, dementia public work will know that we've recently had a parliamentary inquiry into the early diagnosis. And it's been a very important inquiry. One thing we don't, nobody disagrees with a diagnosis should be made as soon as possible in every individual case. So that is, when somebody has a clinical presentation, they should be able to seek a diagnosis immediately. That's not in question. However, what we don't know is if we deliberately try to seek people who aren't, aren't seeking our attention, whether that will do any good or harm. So somebody who has a problem should be able to get an assessment and a diagnosis, even if that assessment and diagnosis is your normal. I, I rarely make that diagnosis. I usually find something to give you, but <laughs> sometimes the diagnosis might be your normal, right? And people should be able to get that assessment as quickly as possible. But if people don't have any problems, should we be trying to get them and give them a diagnosis? And the problem with this sort of screening idea is that it may have particular problems. It might divert resources from diagnosing people with problems. That's the first thing because there's limited amount of time and effort and money that we can do. Secondly, we could, when we try to diagnose people earlier and earlier, we misclassify people. So we give people the diagnosis of dementia who don't have it. That's a problem. And even if we just do some tests and then say, we think you might have dementia, and then you see somebody else and they say, no, you didn't, the people that you even say there's a suspicion of will often go away and think they've got early dementia. Once you get people into this diagnostic process, they get tainted with it, no matter what you do to them. And the, the, also what it does, it raises level of anxiety in the whole population. We have to be very careful about not creating Alzheimer's phobia. There is a delicate balance between the idea of raising awareness and of getting good and appropriate assessment and treatment early on, and then instead worrying a bunch of well people, of well older people, who would be much better off going for a walk. Right? So we have to have that balance right. Okay. So we've now explained a bit about what the types of dementia are, about the diagnosis. We've gone a little bit about early or timely diagnosis. And now we'll talk a bit about assessment and management. One of the things that I have to hopefully teach my, my health professionals is that assessment is always guided towards management. There is no point in assessing somebody if it's not guiding management, because all you're doing is over-assessing somebody. And I know that the complaints that I get about over-assessment, which is largely the fact of duplicate assessments, that people with dementia get seen by somebody, often the aged care assessment team, and then they get seen by some provider who does almost exactly the same assessments again, and then they get seen by somebody else who then repeats the assessments, and then six weeks later somebody else changes and then they get another assessment. And that's annoying for everybody. It's time consuming and irritating. So the idea is that assessment should always be helpful. It should help guide management. The 
the drugs that became available for dementia, for Alzheimer's disease, have meant that a lot more people have sought treatment and assessment. And that's been a good thing. Because the biggest problem 10 years ago was this was a hidden condition with enormous stigma. There is still some stigma, but it's not a hidden condition anymore. So that's been a big improvement for those of you who've been around that time. And the assessments can lead to services and training that have much bigger effects than the drugs. The medications on the whole aren't that effective. But the assessments can lead to other things, good things happening, which people can benefit from. So this is the sort of things that we want. We want assessment of cognition, which is largely memory tests. We want assessment of functioning. To get a diagnosis of dementia, you have to show an impairment of functioning. That, that assessment of functioning will then lead, hopefully, to services and other support which will be useful for people. The other thing is what we want an assessment from informants. For those of you who have ever tried to make a diagnosis of dementia, it's usually not more an intricate memory test that, do, that um, clinch the diagnosis. What clinches the diagnosis is the information from the family. The type of memory impairment, how it's affected somebody's life, how long has it been going, how, does it change, does it fluctuate? These are the important features that actually determine dementia. We often now try to do some sort of care assessment. And one of the things that's really important that we now know in the last couple of years is that people with dementia have enormous medical comorbidities. So in con a condition that affects mainly people in their 70s and 80s and 90s is often accompanied by a huge number of other problems. And these are often the things that actually kill people. And the dementia interferes with the assessment and management of those other conditions. So I won't mention them. Just to say, but of all the tests, the memory tests and so on, they're all about as good as each other. The important thing is you actually should do one. Because if you haven't done one, you, haven't, you don't know what somebody's memory is like. So that's the important thing, to do something. The functional tools are largely based on the personal activities of daily living and the activi instrumental activities of daily living. Now when I try to teach medical students the difference, I can easily explain what instrumental activities of daily living because usually medical students are 60% female and I just say instrumental activities of daily living are the things that boys don't do. <laughs> and they all brighten up and they say, oh, you mean the shopping, cleaning and, and the other housework? And I said, yes, that's them. <laughs> so they follow it instantly. The boys take a little longer. When you're trying to work out somebody who has early, form, early parts of dementia, who has relatively mild disease, the things that will distinguish it are the instrumental activities that they're living, the, the ones that the boys don't do. But the things that are important are things that are complex, things like managing finances, driving, cooking. For those of you who have ever attempted cooking, it's quite a difficult process. And one of the things that people actually complain about is that the cooking doesn't have the same flavour or ability as previously. That the complex activities are different, right? And the shopping, that the shopping is still being done, but items are appearing which aren't required and they're running out of other items. It's the quality of those higher order activities. We now know that the informant information, the information available from families and friends and caregivers, is as effective as the memory tests in diagnosing people with dementia. And the important thing is that it's independent information. So this is a really important area. And this is the idea is, has there been a decline and in what way? The other thing that 
uh, information is very important about is about behaviour. And people with dementia will often exhibit behavioural problems. And families are particularly concerned about this. Now, one of the problems about behaviour is that the behavioural problems does not necessarily correlate with the memory problems. So that behavioural problems can appear throughout the course of somebody with dementia unpredictably. And for that reason, they have to be assessed. Now, what do I mean by behavioural problems? And behavioural problems are things like delusions. Right? This is a common one. And people say, oh, delusions, that's mad stuff. People with dementia don't have it. It's not. It's very common. 50%, in fact, over 50% of people with dementia will have this very common delusion. Somebody is coming into my home and stealing from me or moving things around. Okay? Very, very common. Very hard to deal with because that fixed delusion will not respond to treatment, will not respond to pharmacological treatment. Right? So it's important that we discuss that because that really, really irritates family members because they're accusing neighbours or children about this. And it's very common and we just need to understand about it. The second commonest delusion is one that hardly anybody speaks about. This is the delusion that my wife, spouse, friend, partner is being unfaithful to me. Hardly family members will spend hours avoiding talking about it. You can ask specifically about this and they will avoid it because it's embarrassing. And in fact, family members will say, oh yes, 35 years ago there may have been an incident where my father may have been unfaithful. It's got nothing to do with it, all right? We need to discuss this and talk about it because it's not due to the history it's due to the disease process, right? And it's a frequently accompanied by physical and verbal aggression. We need to know what's setting it off and we need to deal with it sensibly. So these are the sort of things that we do in assessment. We have to assess behavioural problems. There are lots of others. Now my colleague, uh, the other thing is that one of the main symptoms, beha main behaviours that occurs during dementia is depression. It's often quite mild. It can be severe. It can be life-threatening. So again, it's something we just have to keep in the back of our minds about all people with dementia. My colleague Henry Bradati from Sydney with, with another colleague, Brian Draper, have developed this pyramid the idea that the behavioural problems of people with dementia occur in different rates. Right at the bottom, 50% of people with dementia probably have no behavioural problems at all at that time. The next commonest behavioural problem, which is relatively minor, is apathy. This is the idea that people's get up and go has got up and went. So people sitting around doing nothing all day. On the whole, professional carers don't worry about this. In fact, professional carers often like it because they're no problem to you, <laughs> right? Family members are driven insane by it because they can't work out what they're doing all day just sitting around. The next common problems are the rep rep repetitive behaviour and questioning, often very difficult. Again, as you're going up the pyramid. The pyramid goes up to include things like aggression, verbal aggression, physical aggression, problems that occur relatively rarely and often for short periods of time. These are the sort of things that we identify from the assessment process. Doesn't occur in everybody, doesn't necessarily occur in every person as they go through the journey of dementia but it's something that does occur sporadically and unpredictably. 
Col cholinesterase inhibitors. These are the drugs like denipazil rivastigmine and gal galantamine. They basically work. About half the people we try them on, it does some good. About one in 10 people, it does a lot of good. We have no idea who those one in 10 people are, so we spend a lot of time trialing these drugs. Uh, they have relatively modest effects on cognition. Often on behavioural things, and particularly apathy, they can be very effective. It's unpredictable. We now know that the cognitive inhibitors do not work for mild cognitive impairment. My colleague and I showed some years ago that the nepazil, if it has any effects on mild cognitive impairment, are short and very minor. Mamantine's another drug, Ibix is its other name, it's often used for people with dementia. We know that this seems to have a greater effect in people with moderately severe dementia as opposed to mild dementia. And that's why it's prescribed, that's why the PBS listing in Australia sort of encourages that behaviour. So the memantine seems to work, but more for people with moderately severe dementia, people who have got more memory impairment and more troubles with their thinking. Treatment for behavioural and psychological symptoms. Perhaps the most important thing about this area is that we always try non-pharmacological measures first. And the reason is that initially we had very little evidence that anything worked. We now know that risperidone has probably had the most evidence. It works a bit. And it mainly works on people with agitation, right? It tends to calm people down. So, and this is what, and this is the sort of figures, about 46% of people who are given risperidone will have a response in their agitation. That sounds all right, does it not? Unfortunately, 28% of the people giving the placebo will also get a response. Much cheaper, no side effects. <laughs> Placebos are good. If only they would let me prescribe them a bit more. All right, so, th so that's still not so bad. There's a definite improvement with risperidone. The trouble is that in the randomised trials, one in a hundred people given the risperidone in it, over the, the control group developed a stroke, heart attack or death. Those aren't good side effects, right? So this is why we try um, non-pharmacological measures first. It's because we're concerned about the potential side effects of the drug. We also know that risperidone is not the only drug that has this side effect. As far as we can tell, every neuroleptic in older people with dementia runs this risk, runs the risk of strokes, heart attacks and deaths. It's small, it's small, but it's a risk. And that's why we try to do things non-pharmacologically first. One of the things that I thought had been settled a long time ago and hadn't is dementia disclosure. In the, in the 60s, and this is a very scary looking gentleman, isn't it? <laughs> he looks like he could have been from the CIA. He's, an, he's actually, as far as I can tell, a nice man. He's an oncologist. And he led, in the early 60s, the idea that we should tell people with cancer that they have cancer. Because until that time point, people with cancer weren't necessarily being told that they had the disease. We'll go 30 years later. This is in the early 90s. And there, we, there they discussed whether people with Alzheimer's disease should be told the diagnosis. And the answer is yes. Now, clearly, if somebody has severe dementia where they can't absorb the information and remember it, it's a problem. But for other people, it's quite important that we tell them. They have, patients have a right to know. It, evol it allows for a sort of a relationship to develop that can go on through the course of the illness. 
uh, it makes future communications possible, not just easier, possible. And it helps people sort out their legal and financial issues while they still can, because it may not be a possibility later on. The other thing that we now know, and we've known for a while, is that interventions targeted caregivers have at least the same amount of response. They probably have much greater response than the drugs like the cholinesterase inhibitors. The sort of things we talk about are education, support groups, caregiver training, counselling, respite. These things have at least the same effect as the drugs we use. This is a meta-analysis just showing that these things work. We did a small study when I was still in Melbourne in memory clinics. This was led by my colleague, Dina Lajudice. And she demonstrated that if we gave people access to a memory clinic to diagnose dementia as opposed to an aged care assessment team, that the caregivers had significant benefits on their psychosocial health six months later. Okay? Very simple study. I'll leave that. Uh, this is, I know we want some questions, so this, I'll just run through this. The other thing that we've now realised is that people with dementia go to hospital a lot, right? That often people with dementia are going every year to hospital. And that only 6% of the time are they going to hospital because of their dementia. The commonest reason they go there is because of chest infections. They go there with a fractured hip 6% of times. Urinary tract in injury, infections, head injuries, strokes, falls. So these are the sort of things that people with dementia are going into hospital. And once they're in hospital, they're in hospital for almost twice as long as the people without dementia. So this is, this is my belief. So this is where I'm coming to. I don't think the problem of dementia is that hard to assess and manage in Australia. I think we have quite a lot of resources and quite a lot of expertise to do this. I would imagine that the dementia service could be easily accommodated between a regional aged care assessment team <coughs> and a geriatric service with support from other people as required, such as neurologists and psychiatrists. Now, this is the idea of the average ACAT region in Australia, with service, services around 100,000 people. That's actually slightly small, but not, much, not too small. In that region, there are 114 GPs within a, that service 100,000 people. That's based on the fact there are 25,000 GPs in Australia. There would be, in that aged care region, 1,350 people with dementia. Each GP would then have, on average, 12 people with dementia to look after. So that's what the average GP has. And they would have two people with, who would be developing dementia within their patient load. That's on average. That is the problem for GPs to be skilled up in assessment because they do it twice a year. They just do not see enough. So we need a shared care model to provide that service. And there would be, within the average age care assessment team area, 250 people with new onset dementia within that region, five a week. Can we organise a service? Simply. It is easy. And there would be four to 500 people in residential care and the rest of the people in the community who require support for their general practitioners and other staff during that course of illness. I don't think that's very hard to organise. I think in a rich and well-off country like this one, we could really just get this organised very simply. Thanks very much. Well, the, the, the second part is easier. If you come to me through a clinical route with mild cognitive impairment, you're probably much more likely to get dementia, but not inevitably, so maybe 60, 70%.
If you're in the community, that's over five years, I might add. It's over quite long periods. It's not like next year or the year after. If you're in the community and you have that sort of condition, it, the rate of what they call conversion, of developing dementia, is much lower. It can be something like 15% over five years. And it's not inevitable in any way. And the chances are there's almost as much chance that you'll get better as, far as, or as opposed to getting worse. What does that mean? Well, and you talked about triggers. That's really important. If you've ever had an operation, you'll know that you're pretty fuzzy in the head afterwards. You can often develop this sort of syndrome for six months, 12 months, and then you'll get better. If you've ever had, if you ever had pneumonia and you've been measured around that time, you can be feeling pretty groggy for several weeks after. So severe physical illness is often associated with cognitive problems. If you develop heart attacks or heart failure, that's often accompanied by quite severe disturbance in your memory. And if it doesn't kill you, you will get better. Exactly how much better you'll get, we don't know. Exactly. OK, there's three good questions. First one, tau aggregation. Yeah, look, what we've been doing for the last 28 years ain't working. We need to go through a different hypothesis. The tau aggregation hypothesis is at least as prominent as the, the tau is often associated with the tangles, which is the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. The idea of stopping that aggregation is a very worthwhile hypothesis and needs to be tested. I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. Next one is about the combination of drugs. And the, there's no doubt the drugs work by themselves. They actually do work probably a little bit better together. The trouble is then you have to pay for two drugs and the government doesn't want you to. So they will, they'll only pay for one of them. So if they pay for one of them, somebody has to pay for the $180 a month for the other one, right, which is the patient and so on. So that's why they're not used together much here. The cholinesterase inhibitors are coming off patent, so that will be a much cheaper option in the near future. So, yeah, it will ha probably happen more often. There's not much benefit from the two together compared to one or the other, but people can do it. Third question you asked is about pain and the morbidity that people have with dementia. And that's a really important point. We found that when, not we, but other groups have found that when you treat people's pain in residential care, that's much better at controlling behaviour and managing behaviour than giving them drugs for behaviour or anything else. So the idea of treating people's other problems, their other physical problems when they have dementia is really important. And that's the thing that we haven't done well. We've, we've tend to think, let's just, you know, let's focus on the dementia, where we have to focus on all the medical problems. And that's why I think when we're talking about a memory service embedded within a geriatric, regional geriatric aged care team, I think that's the thing we have to start focusing on, which is all the other physical problems. Yeah, well, I, I was, I've been at a lot of meetings and I sort of, I keep getting promised 10 years as well, which is why I'm starting, I, I'm coming from this picture. And that's why, I, that's why I'm, you know, one of the problems I think we've had is that we've often been talking about the tsunami of dementia, you know, that's coming to meet us. And I might add that I'm part of the problem. When you look at somebody my age, I'm one of those, the tsunami of people with dementia, right? Because I'll be in my 80s when all these people are occurring. So people my age, we're the problem, not the solution. And one of the things that I'm conscious of is I want to run things better with what we know now. And I don't think it's that much harder. We can be a much, much more systematic about what we're doing now whilst waiting for a cure, if it becomes available. And whatever we get will not be an absolute cure. It's unlikely to affect all the different types of dementia. We're still going to have 
lots of people with dementia in the system on treatment, even when we do find something that affects disease progression. So I think we should be much more organised what we're doing now. We, if, it's a, if there's a tsunami, I want to know how high the wave is, I want to know where the high ground is, I want to be starting to organise, because that's going to be me down there waiting for the wave to come, because I'm one of those people, you see? So, anyway. <laughs> so, but briefly, it's this. When people seek attention, they are, off, they are worse than the people who don't. So if you are seeking attention because of a memory problem, and usually you've had a family member who also notices the problem, and between you, you end up skirting through the system, and you will usually convince your GP that you need to be seen. So that's the trouble, that the people who are seeking specialist attention, they are worse than the people who aren't. And that's why... I'm trying my best. <laughs> I, come, I come here to give a lecture to discourage future attendees. 